Hello everyone. Today we're going to be solving AQA GCSE Chemistry Higher Tier Question Paper. In this particular video, today we're going to be solving Specimen 2018. This is a part two of the series of the video where today we're going to be solving from question number six to question number nine. This question six is about elect electrochemical cells. A student investigated simple cells using the apparatus shown in figure four. You can see metal one and you can see metal two. In between there is a voltmeter. So if metal two is more reactive than metal one, the measured voltage is positive. So if this one is more reactive and this metal one is less reactive, then the voltage that we're gonna be measuring is going to have a positive value. Whereas if we have the opposite, for example, if we have metal one as more reactive and metal two as less reactive, we are going to have a negative value. This uh, negative 0, 0, 0 is like an example, okay? If metal 1 is more reactive than metal 2, the voltage measured is negative. The bigger the difference in reactivity between the two metals, the larger the voltage produced. So here we can see a comparison. You can see when both of metal 1 and metal 2 are chromium, when they have the same metal, we have zero voltage. It's the same for all metal. So if both of the electrode contains the same metal, then they cannot produce any voltage. Now, the next thing that you're going to notice is that if metal 1 is less reactive, so copper is less reactive in comparison with chromium, which is why we can see that we have a positive voltage. But as vice versa, for example, copper is less reactive in comparison with zinc in metal 1. So zinc gives a negative voltage. Now, let's move into the question. The ionic equation for the reaction occurring at the zinc electrode in the simple cell made using copper and zinc electrode is zinc turning into ZN2 plus and releasing 2 electrode. Zinc is oxidized in this reaction. Explain a reason why this is oxidation. Oxidation is defined by the loss of electron. So we will say zinc has lost electrons. Which one of the metals used was the least reactive? Give a reason for your answer. Metal. In terms of reactivity, we have to understand the metal that is going to produce the most negative values are going to be the least reactive. So in this case, we can see the copper produces the most negative values. So copper will be the least reactive. So the reason would be because it gave the most negative voltage when it was metal 2. The next question says predict the voltage that would be obtained for a simple cell that has iron, metal 1 and copper as metal 2. So when we have iron and copper, so M1 is iron and we are going towards M2 which is copper. Now we know that if the M2 is less reactive then the voltage will be negative. Now, to do a comparison like this, we have to do a comparison uh, because we do not have the value directly. So we have to do a comparison with other metals. So for example, we can do a common comparison, which is, you know, we have available information for both. For example, chromium has been reacted with both iron and chromium has been reacted with both copper. So when we see chromium is reacted with copper, then uh, we get 1.2 volt, chromium being the more reactive metal here. All right, and when we react it with iron, all right, uh, we, we get 0 0.5 volt. And even in this case, chromium being the more reactive metal. So we can do this particular comparison in this way. All right, so chromium to copper is 1.2, whereas chromium to iron is 0 0.5. In that way, we can find the rest of the distance, like what is the value for the iron to copper? It will be 1.2 minus 0 0.5. As give, that gives us 0 0.7 volt. The thing is, the M2 is a less reactive metal. So the rule says if the M2 is a less reactive metal, the value will be negative. So this will be negative. So our rather our subtraction would be 0 0.5 minus 1.2, which gives us the negative 0 0.7. The voltage will be negative 0 0.7. And uh, the comparison would be the voltage with chromium and the voltage with copper is 1.2. And the voltage with chromium and iron is 0 0.5. Since copper is less reactive than iron, all right, so we can do the subtraction and we can find out the voltage as I have shown in above. Hydrogen fuel cells have been developed for powers. Write a word equation for the overall reaction that takes place in a hydrogen fuel cell. Hydrogen react with oxygen to produce water. Write two half equation for the reaction that occurred at the electrodes in a hydrogen fuel cell. So in a hydrogen fuel cell, what happens is that hydrogen, all right, first of all, it turns into ions as hydrogen turns into 2H plus ions and gives up two electrons. Other side, oxygen accepts those hydrogen ions and along with that accepts the electron. But the electron flows out through the circuit and the hydrogen ion flows through the electrolyte. And then once they meet the oxygen, 
oxygen acts as the final electron and proton acceptor and forms water. If you're noticing this particular question, this particular question, you know, both of the equations are not balanced. Actually, balancing them is not a necessity because we're doing half equation in each case. So in each case, they are balanced. However, they are not overall balanced. Sodium carbonate reacts with dilute hydrochloric acid. Sodium carbonate plus hydrochloric acid produces sodium chloride, water, and carbon dioxide. A student investigated the volume of carbon dioxide produced when different masses of sodium carbonate were reacted with dilute hydrochloric acid. This is the method used. Place a known mass of sodium carbonate in a conical flask. Measure 10 cm cube of dilute hydrochloric acid using a measuring cylinder. Pour the acid into the conical flask. Place a bulb in the flask and collect the gas until the reaction is complete. The reaction can be set up as shown in the diagram here. However, this particular diagram has a mistake as you can see that the delivery tube has been already inserted into the liquid, which will force the liquid to come out through this particular tube and we will not collect gas over here. We will collect, rather collect the reactants. Identify the error the way the student set up the apparatus. Describe what would happen if the student used the apparatus as shown in the diagram. This kind of question, you know, this is very easy. You say delivery tube sticks into the acid and the acid would go into the water, all right? The acid would leave the flask through the delivery tube. That would be your answer. The student corrected the error. The student's results are shown in table 4. Mass of sodium carbonate in gram, all right? We can see 0 0.07 up to 0 0.065 mass is used. And we can see the volume of CO2 collected in each cases. The result for 0 0.29 gram of sodium carbonate is anomalous. Such as to what may have happened to cause these anomalous results. We can see from 0 0.23 the volume is 52 and from 0 0.34 the volume is 77. So 0 0.29 must have a volume in between, but rather it has a very small volume. A small volume can indicate maybe the student was unable to close the you know, uh, rubber bunk of the delivery tube. So some gas was able to escape. Why does the volume of carbon dioxide collector stop increasing at 95 CQ? As we can see, we are increasing the volume, we are increasing the amount of sodium carbonate. We can see that further reactions are not happening. That's because in every case, we have used 10 cm cube of acid. So maybe up until 0 0.54 gram of uh, sodium carbonate, the 10 cm cube of acid was necessary. But after that, all the acid got reacted. So there was no more acid left after 0 0.54 gram. What further work could the student do to, do to be more certain about the minimum mass of sodium carbonate needed to produce 95 cm cube of carbon dioxide? If we look into this particular experiment, the student has done an experiment with 0 0.34 gram and 0 0.54 gram. So we may, the student may have produced 95 cm cube anywhere in between those two masses. The student may have used 0 0.5 gram, could have used 0 0.5 gram and yet received 95 cm cube of uh, carbon dioxide gas. So the student can repeat the experiment, but, but with results that are within the interval of 0 0.34 gram to 0 0.54 gram. The carbon dioxide was collected at room temperature and pressure. The volume of one mole of any gas at room temperature and pressure is 24 dm cube. How many moles of carbon dioxide is 95 cm cube? Give your answer in three significant figures. Well, to find out the number of moles of gas, number of mole of gas, the formula will be given volume. If the volume is in cm cube, then we must divide it by 24,000 cm cube per mole. So our 95 divided by 24,000 gives us 0 0.00396 moles. Suggest one improvement that could be made to the apparatus that would give more accurate result, give a reason to your answer. In terms of getting a accurate result, when we want to get accurate result, we must use apparatus tools that are more precise. In this experiment, we have used a measuring cylinder to measure 10 cm cube of acid. So instead of using a measuring cylinder, if we would use a burette to measure the acid, it would be more accurate. All right. And if we were to use a gas syringe instead of an inverted, uh, you know, inverted water collection system. All right. Instead of using that, if we would have used a gas syringe, then we would measure the volume of gas more precisely. So these are the improvements that could be done. One student said that the results of the experiment were wrong because the first few bubbles of gas collected were air. A second student said that this would make no difference to the result, explaining why the second student was correct. That's because they should be, you know, uh, as they collect the gases, carbon dioxide from the flask, all right, will leave at the end. But uh, it will have the same volume as the air that will be displacing 
all right, uh, that will get displaced by the carbon dioxide. So when the experiment is running, it will produce carbon dioxide. The carbon dioxide will first initially displace the air of the uh, uh, flask, and the air will go into the uh, you know measuring cylinder. However, this is not a problem because it will be the same volume. Whatever CO2 displaces in the end, the air will get collected in the measuring cylinder. So the gas collected will not be pure. However, the volume that we will get as a result will be exactly the right answer. Sodium hydroxide neutralizes sulfuric acid. The equation for the reaction is sodium hydroxide reacting with sulfuric acid to produce sodium sulfate and water. Sulfuric acid is a strong acid. What is meant by strong acid? So basically a strong acid is its nature, meaning how easily it can give off H plus iron and can get freely ionized. So the answer will be sulfuric acid is completely ionized in water when dissolved in water. Write the ionic equation for this neutralization reaction. Include state symbol. So we are asked to do the ionic equation of a neutralization. A neutralization reaction ionic equation is very simple. We'll have a H plus ion, which will react with OH minus ion to produce water. Now, because we have, if you notice, we have two sodium hydroxide. So we're going to have two OH minus ion, which will then react with H2SO4, means there are two H plus ion, and then it will produce two H2O. So to balance this up, we're going to put a 2 here, and a 2 here, and a 2 here, and that will balance it up. Okay? All right. Now, they want state symbols. H plus ion is aqueous. OH minus ion is also aqueous. All right? And the resulting water that is produced is liquid. A student used a pipette to add 25 cm cube of sodium hydroxide of unknown concentration to a conical flask. The student carried out a iteration to find out the same volume of 0.1 mol per dm sulfuric acid needed to neutralize the sodium hydroxide. Describe how the student would complete the iteration. You should name a suitable indicator if color change that would be seen. All right. In a question like this, first of all, a you know indicator should be used because we are going to neutralize sodium hydroxide, which is a base. So we can add a particular indicator like phenolphthalein. Oh, phenolphthalein will give a uh, in a purple color uh, in basic solution. So we can add a phenolphthalein. All right, then we're going to add the 0.1 mole per dm cube hydrogen, the sulfuric acid, into the burette. And we are then going to drop wise, allow the sulfuric acid to fall into the uh, sodium hydroxide solution, all right, in the conical flask. And once we do that, we're going to swirl it so that, it, you know, the indicator changes color. And we're going to keep on adding the acid until, all right, the indicator changes from pink to colorless because we're using phenolphthalein as an indicator. Phenolphthalein is colorless in acid. Once it goes to colorless, then we're going to know that the reaction has completed. The student carried out five titration. Her results are shown in table five. Volume of 0.1 mole per dm cube of sulfuric acid was used, and we can see there are a few different values that we can see over here. Obviously, not all of these particular titrations are going to be accepted because titrations are accepted within the range of 0.1 cm cube. Okay, and we can see that it's 27.05 and 27.15 and 27.15. These three titrations are within the uh, 0.1 cm cube range. Concordant results are within 0.1 cm cube of each other. Use the student's car concordant result to work out the mean volume of 0.1 mole per dm cube sulfuric acid added. So the student can use titration 3, 4, and 5. The equation for the reaction is sodium hydroxide plus sulfuric acid, sodium sulfate plus water. Calculate the concentration of sodium hydroxide. Give your answer to three significant figures. In order to calculate the concentration of sodium hydroxide, first of all, we need to find out the number of moles of sulfuric acid that is used. Then we are going to do the ratio of sodium hydroxide with sulfuric acid. As you can see, there is two is to one ratio. After we do the two is to one ratio, then we can find out the number of moles of sodium hydroxide. Once we find out the number of moles of sodium hydroxide, we can use the volume of sodium hydroxide that we have found here, all right? And the number of moles of sodium hydroxide that we have found in this uh, 8.5. And then we can use both of them to find out the concentration of sodium hydroxide. The student did another experiment using 20 cm cube of sodium hydroxide solution with a concentration of 0.1 mole, 1.8 mole per dm cube. The relative formula mass of sodium hydroxide is 40. Calculate the mass of sodium hydroxide in 20 cm cube of this solution. So to do this particular calculation, first of all, we need to know the number of moles of sodium hydroxide that is used 
to make 20 cm cube of 0.18 mole per dm cube OH. Then we are going to find the mass of NaOH by multiplying the number of moles with the MR of sodium hydroxide. We're dividing the 20 with 1000 because uh, this gives us an uh, answer in dm cube. Question number nine. This question is about the reaction between ethene and bromine. We can see ethene is reacting with bromine to produce you know, one to dibromoethane. Complete the reaction profile diagram for figure six. Draw a labeled arrow to show the energy given out dH, that division energy. So we can see that the product has less energy than the reactant. So we know that we have to cross the activation energy barrier. We will have to label that activation energy as, or we can say that it is Ea, and we are going to label the enthalpy change. Enthalpy change will be equivalent to the level where the product is. So this is enthalpy change. The enthalpy change is the energy given out. When ethene reacts with bromine, energy is required to break the covalent bonds in the molecules. Explain how a covalent bond holds two atoms together. So we know that in a covalent bond, electrons are shared between two atoms. So the electrostatic force of attraction between the shared pair of electron and shared pair of negatively charged electron and the positively charged nuclei of both of the atoms hold that particular covalent bond together. Figure 7 shows the displayed formula for the reaction of ethene with bromine. We can see ethene is reacting with bromine to produce 1 to dibromoethane. The bond enthalpies and the overall energy change is shown in table 6. So both the bond energies are given here. Use the information in table 6, figure 7, to calculate the bond energy for the BR, BR bond. We have to calculate the bond energy in BR, BR bond. In order to do that, we have to finish this entire calculation. So first of all, what you're going to do is what bonds are formed and what bonds are broken. If we notice carefully, the bonds that are broken in this case are BR, BR. And the bonds that are broken are CC double bond. These two bonds are broken. Now we're going to look into the bonds that are formed. In terms of bond formed, the CC bond is formed, CBR, CBR bond is formed. Now to find out the overall energy change, we have to do bonds broken minus bonds formed. So now what we have to do is basically we will have to make the subject. And so once we make the subject, all right, we're going to get the result. So we're going to make the BR, BR subject. This gives us a total answer of 193. Here it shows the reaction between ethene and chlorine and is similar to the reaction between ethene and bromine. The more energy level shells of electrons an atom has, the weaker the covalent bond it forms. Use the above statement to predict and explain how the overall change, energy change for the reaction between ethene and chlorine will differ from the overall energy change for the reaction of ethene and bromine. They have already given us about that it's going to be more. The energy is going to be more. What we have to talk about is we have to talk about the size and the strength. So chlorine atoms have fewer electrons in their upper shell. All right. Uh, so they have, you know, they have fewer electrons in their inner shell in general. Uh, and Chlorine atoms form stronger bonds with uh, carbon, all right, or between the chlorine and chlorine. The CLCL bonds are stronger than BRBR, and the CCL bonds are stronger than CBR. So more energy is required to break the bond between the chlorine. However, more energy is given out when the bond is formed between carbon and chlorine. So the overall energy change depends on the size of the energy changes, you know, uh, like for example, how much energy is needed to break the CLCL bond and how much energy will be released for the formation of CCL bond. So that, that's where the main, you know, overall energy change depends. However, the main conclusion is CCL bond energies are more exothermic. Uh, so the conclusion that can be done is that if CCL bond energy changes are more, then the overall energy change will be more exothermic. And if the CCL bond changes are less, you know, it's less exothermic, then the overall experiment will be less exothermic. However, we can tell how overall change will differ as we do not know which changes are more. Guys, we are at the end of this particular question paper. Thank you for continuing with me with this particular question paper. Let's jump up for your exam and, uh, you know, see you in the next video.